Well, thank you folks for joining us. Welcome to Grace. Uh, we've been looking at the book of Romans, which is Paul's sixth and final letter before he was accompanied to Rome where he was placed under house arrest and from where he would write his remaining seven letters. So he wrote the first six on three journeys, and we're looking at the final one. As you recall, the epistle to the assembly in Rome was written while Paul was on that third journey. This is the last. He wrote three letters on journey number three, first and second Corinthians, and then Romans. So let's return to that letter and pick up where we left off in chapter 12, where Paul was defining the word worship as God views worship. Our text for this lesson is going to come from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, and today we'll be taking a closer look at verses 4 and 5. So let's begin with verse 1. Paul writes here, I beseech you, therefore, plead with you, beg you, ask you, uh, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And as we saw earlier, that word service uh, is, is worship, is literally the word worship. So as we've discovered, the word reasonable is the Greek logikos, from which we get our English word logical. So Paul's not asking believers to do something that's unreasonable or non-realistic. He isn't asking us to do something that's impossible for us to do. He's asking us to do that which is wise. We might say that which is prudent and that which makes perfectly good sense where believers are concerned. What is the motivation for this living sacrifice that Paul's requesting of us? Well, the answer is the multiple mercies that God has bestowed upon us and he's done so graciously. And of course, the living sacrifice that Paul's talking about is the sacrifice of ourselves on a daily basis where service to the body of Christ is concerned. The living sacrifice that Paul is asking us to become is going to require something of us, according to the apostle. In fact, it's going to require two things. Uh, those two things appear in verse 2, where Paul continues with his definition of worship, as that word has been given to us from, uh, we might say, the drawing board of heaven. The first requirement for worship that God considers reasonable worship sits in the first seven words of, of sentence uh, number 2 here, verse number 2. Be not conformed to this world. That's a requirement. But be ye transformed by re the renewing of your mind, requirement number two, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And this perfect will of God has to do with our day-by-day -day worship. What did we learn from 1 John 2, 16? Well, let's revisit that verse because this gives us a much better sense of what being conformed to this world is all about. John, being fully aware and believing Paul's gospel by the time he wrote this epistle, said this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world, now he names it, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So the world system is designed to feed those things that are of the world, namely the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is why the Apostle Paul called it this present evil world, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. Now, if the world was evil in the Apostle Paul's day, do you suppose that the Apostle of Grace would consider the world to be any less evil in our day? I think we can all see that it isn't. If you are feeding or seeking to feed that which is of the world, again, meaning the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. In other words, if your focus has been that on serving the desires of the flesh, your church going, your singing, your participation in any number of religious programs or activities cannot be considered reasonable worship because reasonable worship requires serving others above serving the desires of our flesh. Um, by using the expression living sacrifice, Paul's telling us that we are either setting aside the serving of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life in order to focus on that which serves others or we are willing to set aside serving others because our focus is on serving the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, I understand the tendency of the flesh is to say, why can't I have it both ways? Why can't I do both at the same time? Why can't my worship include that which serves my fleshly-minded interests at the same time I'm serving others? Uh, the flesh would like to make it a win-win situation, wouldn't it? Um, why can't I combine the two it is the argument of the flesh. I'll serve others if I can serve my own fleshly desires at the same time. Uh, the truth is, the flesh will always demand self-satisfaction. The flesh will always say, there must be something in this for me. So why can't we continue? Why can't we combine the two? Why can't we serve others as long as we gain something in return that serves the desires of our flesh in the process? 
And the answer to that question is sitting in Paul's statement about the standard that God has set when it comes to what God considers to be reasonable worship. And Paul doesn't leave us guessing as to the standard that God has set. God knew that if we set our own standard as to what is and what is not reasonable worship, our flesh would always get in the way. Uh, the flesh would always demand its own place at the table, we might say. So God has set the standard for us. He doesn't leave that for us to determine. The remainder of chapter 12 defines that standard. We'll be looking at that further uh, coming ahead, though. But first notice how Paul reveals that God has given each of us that standard as we come to verse number 3, Romans chapter 12 once again. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of or the standard relative to faith. God's given us the standard. What is that standard? This is where Paul's taking us next. Number one, God's standard is service that unifies and, and edifies the entire body of Christ, not just select members that satisfy our own fleshly interests. Notice what Paul did not say here in this passage. Paul did not say, think of yourselves more highly than you're apt to think, while your natural tendency will be to prefer others. So make sure that you think as highly of yourselves as you ought to think. You should always be looking out for number one. Work on your self-esteem. Uh, lest your self-esteem take a hit. Uh, after all, if you don't look out for your own interests, who will? Uh, Paul didn't say that, did he? That wasn't his point. That's more in line with what the world is telling us we need to be doing. And Paul's just told us that we're not to be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we not think of ourselves more highly than we ought. You see, the flesh will always have the tendency to be intoxicated with itself, uh, at least when it comes to God's standard for reasonable worship, which is the context of this chapter. The transformation of mind that comes by way of renewed thinking is the transformation that makes us willing to set self aside to actually prefer others above self as we recognize the importance that each and every, every believer plays when it comes to the overall health of the body of Christ uh, as a whole. In fact, Paul's going to tell us about preferring others above self in this very chapter. Just a half dozen verses ahead in verse 10, Paul states, Be kindly affection to one another with brotherly love in honor, actually preferring one another. So what is our motivation for not honoring or not preferring some above others, uh, for not being sectarian, we might say, when it comes to that direction of our agape service? Uh, the motivation sits in verses 4 and 5 where the apostle said, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, the same function within the assembly, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Now I talked about this in a previous message. Every member of the body of Christ is as uniquely and thoroughly joined to every other member of the body of Christ to the same degree that we are joined to Christ himself. So Paul tells us about that the intricacy of that union in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30, where he states, For we are members of his, of Christ's body, of Christ's flesh, and of his bones. So this is a, a spiritual union, a spiritual oneness that came by God's design. If what the Apostle Paul has just told us is correct, and we know that it is, then our worship of God can be considered to be, can be, considered to be no more acceptable, acceptable to God than our agape service to the member of Christ that we like the least. That's, that's something to ponder and take very seriously. Not only is every member of the body of Christ of equal importance to God, Every member of the body of Christ is of equal importance when it comes to the effective functioning and well-being of the church, which is Christ's body. It's interesting that in the first Corinthian epistle, Paul describes the activity of agape love in chapter 13. But in chapter, the, the chapter immediately following the love chapter, 13, comes chapter 12, and Paul talks about the oneness. Our, he talks about our interconnectivity, the interconnectivity of the body of Christ, along with the importance of each member this living organism includes. Notice verses 12 through 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I think you'll see the correspondence of this chapter with what Paul's been asking of us in chapter 12 of the Romans epistle. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. This is not a water baptism. This is a, uh, 
a baptism, an immersion into a person, whether we be Jews or Gentiles. Uh, so Paul wasn't saying whether we be only certain Jews, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free. And that bond or free, of course, had to do with whether they were under the law, had been born under that law or not, and have been all made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member but many. So right after making this statement about the interconnectedness of the individual members of the body of Christ, Paul's going to illustrate the importance of that interconnectedness by pointing, pointing us to the human body. And he's going to illustrate it in, in order to make his case. Have you ever considered the value, the significance of the various components of the human body? Uh, it's far more intricate than you might imagine. To set the stage, let me give an example apart from the human body. I'm sure that most listening to this message have taken a walk through the woods or through the forest at some time or other. Um, have you ever walked through the woods? I know people here have. Um, have you ever stopped to consider what you were walking on in that hike through the woods? Um, some years ago, a group of scientists took a block of forest soil, and that block was one square foot and one inch deep, and they analyzed it, and guess what they found? Uh, that one square foot block of soil contained 865 mites, 265 springtails, which the dictionary tells me are wingless insects, 22 millipedes, 19 adult beetles, and at least 12 other various minute life forms. That's a grand total of 1,356 creatures in a single sample of that plot of dirt. But what the scientists did not attempt to count were the millions of fungi and algae um, present in that soil along with approximately 2 billion bacteria. How many had that in mind while you were walking uh, in the woods? These are just some things we seldom think about. Something else we seldom think about is the important that, importance that each component of that one square plot of dirt was playing when it came to the overall, overall health of that soil uh, that comprised them. There's something else we seldom think about. Has anyone heard of a Swedish photographer and scientist named Leonard Nielsen, who died in January, by the way, of this year. Uh, Leonard Nielsen was famous for his work with the electron microscope, so that may give you a better idea. What Mr. Nielsen was able to do was to document close up on film the activity that takes place within and upon the human body. In fact, the activity that takes place upon the human body is enough to, to stagger your minds. There are more living creatures, living organisms on your body right now than there are people on planet Earth. Now, we don't like to think about that, but that's absolutely true. In fact, it's very important that they be there. They play an important function when it comes to the health, your health. Uh, if you think that one square foot of soil was a busy place, you should see what's taking place right now, both within and upon each of us. Um, Aurelius Augustinus, otherwise known as St. Augustine, wrote these words, Men go abroad to wonder at the height of the mountains, at the huge waves of the sea, at the long courses of the rivers, at the vast compass of the ocean, at the circular motion of the stars as they pass by themselves without understanding. How true that was. Well, let's take a moment to consider the activity taking place within the human body and the importance of that activity because it is Paul that is comparing the, the components of the human body to the members of the body of Christ in this Corinthians letter. Do you remember what David had to say in, in the book of Psalms? I'm sure you will as soon as you see the uh, beginning of that sentence. Listen to David's words in Psalms 139. Verses 13 and 14. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me, an expression also defined as being woven or knit together in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy, work, thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Now think about David's words, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The Hebrew word fearfully, Yahweh, means with profound respect and regard. In other words, God put detailed consideration into the makeup of the body of his human creation, man. Uh, Dr. Paul Brand, Philip Yancey, chose the words of the psalmist, fearfully and wonderfully made, uh, as the title of a book they co-authored in 1980. If you've read that book, you know that these authors detailed the intricate workings of the human body in a way that most of us have never taken the time to consider. Let me... Let me quote just two short sections of their book. One has to do with the sense of sight and the other with our sense of touch. First, consider your eyesight. We often take seeing for granted, but think about what actually takes place within the human eye in order for you and me to be able to see. And keep in mind that the size of the soil I mentioned a few moments ago 
uh, was one square, one foot square, and one inch deep. Contrast that with a human eye that's only a fraction of that size. Listen to this quote from the book, A Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. The amoeba has one cell. Inside the human eye, peering at him, are 107 million cells. Seven million are cones, each loaded to fire off a message to the brain when a few photons of light cross them. Uh, cones give us our, our band of color awareness, and because of those cones, we can easily distinguish a thousand shades of color. The under, other hundred million cells are rods, um, and they, they're backup cells for use in low light. When only rods are operating, we do not see color, uh, as on a moonlit night when everything loo uh, looms in shades of gray, but we can distinguish a spectrum of light so broad that the bright, brightest light we perceive is a billion times brighter than the dimmest light that we can perceive, end quote. Are we not fearfully and wonderfully made? Through that intricate system, containing millions of active parts, all performing their specialized tasks, all communicating with the brain within a divine designated hierarchy, you and I are able to see. Um, our one-inch eyes <laughs> are a whole lot busier than our, that one-foot plot of soil. But that's just one aspect of the human body. Consider our basic sense of touch for just a moment. Every square inch of our body has its own unique response to touch. One scientist mapped out our ability to feel by the amount of weight it takes uh, for a person to sense that, that an object has come into contact with his skin. Again, I'm going to quote from Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. The soles of our feet, thickened for a daily regimen of abuse, do not report in until a weight of 250 milligrams per square inch is applied. The back of the forearm was triggered by 33 milligrams of pressure, and the back of the hand by 12 milligrams. The really sensitive areas are the fingertips, 3 milligrams, and the tip of the tongue, 2 milligrams. But the cones of the eyes fire off a response if just two-tenths of a milligram of pressure is applied. Now, isn't that amazing? Through the study that's been done, a stray eyelash, he continues to write, can make a baseball player stop the game. He can concentrate on nothing else. <laughs> In contrast, an eyelash on his forearm would, would go unnoticed. Similarly, a wise mosquito, where is he going to land? Well, most likely he'll land on the forearm, not, not, forearm, not on the sensitive hand, uh, if he wants to go undetected. If only a foolhardy insect uh, would attempt a secret landing on the lips. Uh, the human body is truly a community of, of great and magnificent parts. Uh, a million trillion cells forming blood, muscle, bone, skin, nerves, and organs, each cell programmed to perform the precise duty that God designed it to perform, designed it to perform, and all for the common good of the entire body. Uh, we've gone through the scientific info for a reason here. The Apostle Paul used many metaphors when it came to describing the believers that the body of Christ comprises. He used a runner, a boxer, he used a wrestler. You may recall that back in uh, chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, Paul likened believers to a field. He said, ye are God's husbandry, you're God's field. One plants the seed, another comes along to supply the water, but God gives the increase in that field. Uh, then in another instance, Paul compares believers corporately to a building. Now we found that metaphor of a building in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. Paul told us that he had laid the foundation to this building, which is Jesus Christ, and he laid that foundation according to the dispensation or the economy of the grace of God in the mystery concerning our oneness, not only in Christ, but with one another. Then as we've also seen here in 1 Corinthians, Paul uses the metaphor of the human body uh, with its various and crucial components uh, to the spiritual living organism, organism, the building that God designed, called the body of Christ. So each and every believer is a part of the building called the body of Christ. Which is more important, the floor joists or the roof trusses when it comes to a home? Are the boards in a wooden structure more important than the nails that hold those boards together? Uh, is the mortar that binds the block less important than the blocks themselves? Uh, the idea is fairly simple here. Each component plays a crucial role if you want to end up with a sound and stable building that's capable of weathering the elements that come against it. Um, Paul's telling us that the same is true when it comes to the building called the body of Christ. Each component is absolutely essential. Whereas an earthly structure, whether house or skyscraper, is continuously exposed to the atmospheric elements, such as the wind, rain, sun, heat, cold, otherwise called weather, 
and must be constructed soundly um, in order to protect it from those elements that can make it unstable. The building called the body of Christ is continuously exposed to an element that can make it unstable as well. However, the condition that brings instability where the body of Christ is concerned is not called weather. It's called pride. And just as the weather has its various components, such as the wind, rain, sun, heat, and cold, pride has its own elements. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, otherwise known as pride's verbal put-downs and uh, travel along the gossip trail. An earthly structure may look magnificent on the outside, but what if the wood within the building is rotting? Have, how a stable a building do you really have if the wood is rotting inside behind those walls? That's precisely what was happening in a spiritual sense in that assembly in Corinth. And it's what Paul was warning against when he wrote his letter to the saints at Rome, to Philippi and to Colossae. Uh, Paul knew that that which was in the heart of men would be working overtime to bring instability, to rot away from the inside the building called the body of Christ. Pride is the, is the inner root that's ever working to weaken the structure God designed as his temple today, a spiritual building comprised of all believers. If you want to see an assembly working apart from the honoring of any building code whatsoever, no standard of faith in place, Paul gives us a stark look at the heart of mankind. I'm sure you know the assembly I'm talking about. When Paul wrote to that assembly, it was an assembly in Corinth. Pride was certainly on display when it came to the saints at Corinth. Every one of the manifestations of human pride was operating there and operating in robust fashion in Corinth. No member was recognizing, much less appreciating, the importance of the other members. It's interesting that this is precisely where the Apostle Paul used the human body to picture the necessity of those carnally-minded saints to appreciate the importance of each of the components, the individual members, that assembly comprised. When we look at the standard of faith that God has set forth in the book of Romans, our current book, we can see that there was, there was no building code. There was no standard at all in place in Corinth. Envy and jealousy, both born of pride, were operating in full-bodied fashion on one side of the aisle, while on the other side, we see conceit and pretension operating. So you have a, a large spectrum there. Envy, jealousy, one side, conceit, contention on the other side, and pretension. Uh, both manifestations of, of the pride of life. And they were, they were swaggering around there in, uh, in, uh, in Corinth. Let me set the stage, and we'll shuttle back and forth between Paul's human body illustration in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and his standard of faith exhortation in Romans chapter 12 as well. The saints in Corinth were divided into two different groups. For lack of a better description, we might call them the haves and the have-nots. And this was all centered in the, um, in the assembly gifts that were in operation during the time of Paul's three apostolic missions, while he was reaching out to Jews who had been born under that law contract, as well as Gentiles who had never been placed under the law contract in the first place. By the way, you're, you're going to see an interesting change in the listing of the gifts as Paul reached the, furthest, the furthermost point of his third journey where he wrote the book of Romans. You see, those are different gifts than you see in 1 Corinthians. Paul's going to show us how pride was working, both in the group uh, of the haves and also in the have-nots in the Corinthian outcalling. For instance, the haves could say, I have a more uh, honorable gift. I have a more visually evident gift, a magnificent gift to look at. You don't have it. So this places me on a higher plane, spiritually speaking, than it places you. Uh, you hear conceit and pretension at work in the group I've, I've called the haves. Both are manifestations of pride. It was an I'm better than you attitude. Uh, then on the other side of the aisle were the have-nots, as I've called them. This is where envy and jealousy were in full swing. Envy and jealousy are also manifestations of the pride of life. You can, you can hear the expression, I'm deserving of that which you've been given, that which I've been shortchanged of. I, I call this the frustration of the pride in nature. I called it that in an earlier message, that, that self-bent that has given birth to the it's not fair statement. It's a declaration we hear so often today. The haves were boasting, and the have-nots were envying and seeking. Pride was operating in both groups. So the Apostle Paul had to deal with both attitudes in his Corinthian letter. Now, I like to call the Corinthian epistle Paul's handbook on love versus carnality, or we might say pride versus humility. 
attitude was the issue in Corinth. So it's really a handbook on humility. As we pick it up in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15 through 20, we're going to watch as Paul first addressed those with envy, those who felt they had been, had been given the lesser gifts and were deserving of what others had been given, the, the, the more visually magnanimous gifts. This is where Paul used the analogy of the human body with its various components or members in order to illustrate his point. Notice verses 15 and 16. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is the ear therefore not of the body? Paul was obviously using the foot and the ear as examples of parts of the human body that, that some might consider not quite as important as other parts. So I think you can see his reasoning. And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Paul used the ear in contrast to the eye because Paul knew that most would consider the ear to be inferior to the eye in human body terms. Where do the ladies place the eyeliner and the eyeshadow? Uh, I think there's very seldom that they apply that on the ear, but they don't go on the ears unless your aim is off. The ladies glamorize the eyes while not giving the same attention to the ears. You see what Paul's doing here? How often do you hear the expression, look into my ears? Uh, somehow that doesn't have quite the same ring as look into my eyes. The area around the eyes is brushed. It's eyelashed and, and, and batted. Ears, on the other hand, how often are the ears called the windows to the soul? Uh, I've yet to hear that one. Likewise, have you ever seen a woman apply makeup to her knees? I suppose that could happen, but generally speaking, where does the makeup go? It goes on that part that the woman believes to be more glamorous. It goes on the face, and more specifically, all around the eyes. The natural tendency of the ladies is to emphasize those parts that are considered to be more visually glamorous. My guess is that you've never read in poetry or even heard in song what beautiful ears you have. Um, if you were courting a fellow who said that, your immediate thought would be what? <laughs> How strange. What's wrong with my eyes? There's something wrong with my face. The same holds true with the foot and with the, with the hand back in verse 15. We, we naturally think of the hands as being more visually glamorous than the feet. Now, be honest, ladies. If you could only apply, apply polish to either one or the other, the fingernails or the toenails, where would you place the polish first? Um, I've been told there are far more manicures than pedicures, given all the... Um, Pedicures are quite popular today. So ladies, if the hands are more glamorous than the feet, we can't have those feet running far behind, can we? Why, we need to help those feet catch up. What do we need? Why, of course, we need shoes. <laughs> uh, Amela Marcos comes to mind here. She had a collection of 3,000 pairs plus pairs of shoes. We have to dress those feet up, don't we? Now, if you're a lady, you understand these things. We men, on the other hand, have to, to learn to understand them. Otherwise, we could go crazy. But again, we tend to glamorize certain parts of the body above other parts. You see why Paul's using the human body and the glamorization of the human body with members of the body of Christ? As he's making his illustration. Paul's point through the analogies he's used here is that some of the saints in the Corinthian assembly were discontent with the gifts they'd been given. What they were doing is they were attaching more importance to those gifts they deemed to be the most glamorous or more appealing to the eyes of others than their own areas of giftedness. In other words, they were elevating uh, others. They were envious uh, of the gifts they desired that they be given that had been given to others. So Paul was appealing to their common sense. He, he did that to combat the jealousy and the conceit of the carnal saints. Listen again as he applies truth to the illustration he's just given. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, am I not of the body? Is it the foot therefore is the foot therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it the ear therefore is the ear? Is it the ear therefore not of the body? The obvious truth is, of course, they are both integral, vital, both important parts of the body, vitally important parts of the body. Every member is a joint member of the same body. So Paul tells us in verse twenty. But now he wrote, They are many members, yet but one body. So the first principle Paul wants us to see is this. Every member of the body of Christ is an important and part, a vital part of the body of Christ. And of course, Paul had the body of Christ in mind when he wrote this. One is not more important than the other. 
because all are interrelated and integral to the overall health and well-being, the overall function of the body of Christ. Think back to that baseball player that I mentioned just a few moments ago. What good is all that muscle? What good is all that, um, all that natural ability, um, along with the trained motor skills that um, that pitcher is acquired to deliver, say, the perfect fastball, if that pitcher gets an eyelash in his eye? What good does it do him? The eye can shut down the entire game, athleticism, skill, notwithstanding. So every member of the body of Christ is an important and vital part of the body, capital B, if the body of Christ is to function the way that God intends it to function. This brings us to Paul's second principle. Every member has a unique and important role or function to perform within the body of Christ. Verse 17, Paul says, If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? This is so obvious that it should need no explanation. When it came to the spiritual gifts, Paul wanted the Corinthian saints to realize that each gift had a unique and definite pur purpose. Therefore, every member of the body of Christ has a role to play and is necessary, essential for the smooth and efficient operation of the body as a whole. Go back to Paul's illustration of the eye and the ear of the human body for just a moment. If we were to take a poll, which one do you think the majority of people will consider most important, the eye or the ear? Now just consider for a second. If you had to go through life without one or the other, which one would you rather not lose, your hearing or your sight? I would guess that most people would opt for losing their hearing and retain their eyesight. Uh, would you think that to be a fair assumption? In this case, the eyes would be deemed to be more important than the ears, would they not? Yet sometimes, God has a way of illustrating, of demonstrating to us the importance of what man deems to be of lesser importance. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. We walk by faith and not by what? Sight. <laughs> We walk by faith and not by sight. Tell me, how does a person come to faith? Paul tells us the answer to that in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, a verse I know you'll recognize. So then faith cometh by seeing? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So while we would opt to lose hearing over sight, it's faith that comes by hearing. I'm sure you've noticed Paul did not say faith cometh by seeing and seeing by the word of God. Spiritually speaking, where did God put the emphasis when it came to believing the gospel of the grace of God? He put the emphasis on hearing, not on seeing. Same holds true for the feet and the hands. Have you thought about that? We need to glamorize the hands, as I said earlier, but look at how God demonstrates the importance of the less glamorized members in Romans chapter 10, verse 15. See if it's the hands here. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the hands? How beautiful are the what? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad, glad tidings of good things. Paul's point is that every member of the body of Christ, no matter the glamorization from fleshly perspective of the roles we each play, is of equal importance, of equal value and significant from God, significance from God's perspective. You see, it wasn't, it wasn't that gift that the saints at Corinth considered to be of greater or lesser value. It, it wasn't even a matter of the spiritual maturity of the spiritual stature in the minds of the gifted. There's no believer that is of greater importance, greater or lesser significance to God when it comes to the body of Christ than any other believer. This brings us to Paul's third point. Every member of the body of Christ is set in the body according to God's plan and God's purpose. Paul makes this point in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as, is, as it has pleased us? as it hath pleased him. God knew you before you were born. He knew whether or not you would come to believe the gospel of Christ before you ever drew a breath. And he knew before he ever knit you in your mother's womb what your inclinations would be, where your talents and the circumstances of your life would take you. And therefore, he knew the place that he had in mind for you, the role that he had in mind for you to serve in the living organism called the body of Christ. Isn't that amazing? Did you catch what Paul's just told us in verse 18? God set the members of the body as it hath pleased whom again? The answer is not as it pleased them. The answer is as, as it hath pleased him. Keep in mind, the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is the spiritual gifts that were in operation during that time. Um, and so this is a, a gift context passage. However, we know that it also could be applied in a general sense to the body of Christ today. What do the Jews require? 
Well, the Jews required a sign, Paul told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. So the gifts, known as the sign gifts, um, were still in operation at that time, during the time of Paul's first three journeys, uh, when he was reaching people that had been born under the law, uh, according to the new economy. As I said previously, Paul talks about a different set of gifts in Romans chapter 12, his final letter while on that third journey. So we have to keep 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in its proper context. Um, God had set members of the body of Christ that pleased him during the time when the sign gifts were still in operation. But again, don't forget, he's also set the members of the body of Christ as it hath pleased him after all those Jews who had been born to that law contract had heard the gospel of Christ in the body of Christ that exists today. It wasn't a matter of spirituality when it, when it came to the ones possessing the sign gifts during the time of Paul's three journeys. It wasn't even a matter of desire. Nor was it a matter of seeking or coaching or even of praying. Uh, God set them members of the body as it hath pleased him, Paul stated. No matter what the spiritual gift, every member was given the gift that best suited God's plan and purpose for the exercise of that gift in order to further God's purpose in, his, in that particular time with the body of Christ. God's purpose at that time included the following particular believers, given particular gifts, designed to fulfill a particular purpose during a particular course of time. Uh, the particular believers were some of the saints in Corinth. At least some of the particular gifts being coveted by some of those Gentiles were sign gifts, as we see here. The particular sign gifts were given with a particular purpose of sending a particular message to those Jewish unbelievers next door to Corinth there. The message that they had missed it when it came to acknowledging uh, their Messiah and that he was alive and that God had made him Lord, the judge of the living and the dead. One of those more visually spectacular sign gifts was the gift of being able to speak in a language that had not previously been learned by the speaker. Keep in mind, once again, that not all of the gifts were sign gifts, yet the carnal Corinthian believers were coveting the gifts they thought they would, that would elevate them in the sight and in the minds of those around them. As they reasoned it, uh, the gifts that elevated the stature of those so gifted were the gifts that involved the supernatural manifestation of miraculous phenomena taking place. Paul's point to those folks was this, you cannot all have the same gift. And besides, just because you think some gifts are more glamorous, the gifts you are envious of are not necessarily the most important gifts in the mind of God. You cannot all have the same gift, so be content that you are fulfilling God's purpose with the gift he has freely bestowed upon you. Every position of service is of equal importance to God and to the body of Christ through whom he's fulfilling his purpose. This brings us to verses 19 and 20. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. Paul's just dealt with the have-nots, the one who, ones in whom, whose pride had led them to envy and covet the more visually spectacular gifts. He was now ready to turn his attention to the haves, the ones who had been gifted with the more visually spectacular gifts. Pride was still in full bloom. Rather than envying and coveting, as the have-nots were doing, this group, the haves, was guilty of conceit and pretension. In their eyes, and because of the area of their giftedness, they considered themselves to be uh, the cream of the crop, in a manner of speaking. Uh, uh, um, always on top, spirituality-wise. Uh, a cut above the others. Their gifts were more impressive, is how they reasoned it. They had gifts such as being able to perform miraculous healing. How impressive would that have been? being able to speak in a foreign language they had never had to learn. Can you see their reasoning, why they thought they were so high up on the, on the rung of the ladder of spirituality? After all, everyone could see how important and impressive their gifts were. They were visually evident. The thinking of the haves went along these lines. If you do not possess these visually spectacular gifts, these gifts that make an immediate and stark impact and impression on others, then you have very little importance in the body of Christ. Therefore, we who possess the more glamorous gifts have no need of you. That was their reasoning. This group reasoned they could, they could run things all by themselves. They didn't need the believers they considered to be of little value. There was no inferiority complex uh, at work when it came to this bunch. In fact, just the opposite was true. They had a, a superiority complex. Paul would have to address the superiority complex of the haves, just as he had addressed the envy and, and the, uh, of the uh, coveting of the have-nots. He laid down three principles when it came to the covetous group. So we can expect some principles from Paul pertaining to the group possessing all the, all the 
uh, Uber is there. Paul's first principle to the piously arrogant group was this. Those supposing themselves to be greater are dependent upon those they perceive to be the lesser. Notice verse 21. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again of the head to the feet. I have no need of you. Now the key verse, the key word in verse 21 was that word need used two times. Here again, Paul resorts to a most simple illustration to demonstrate his point. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee. Talk to a person who has no use of his hands when he wants to read a book. Uh, I know electronics can do wonderful things when he wants to scratch his nose. And you can just see how necessary the hands are and how much you'd miss them if all of a sudden you had no hands. The eyes need the hands in order to function to an optimum degree. Uh, the same holds true in the second half of the verse. The head cannot say to the feet, I have no need of you. Your head can make decisions to go anywhere it wants to go. Your head can make a decision to go anywhere, but try going there without the use of your feet. The greater, from one perspective, is totally dependent upon the lesser. That's Paul's point here. That's his first point. We find his second point in verse 22. This one's so closely related to his first point, actually. Not only is the greater dependent upon the lesser, but point number two is the member thought to be less honorable must recognize that the member considered to be the lesser is indispensable. This takes what Paul's just said and intensifies it. Notice verse 22. Nay, or in no way, much more those members of the body which seem to be or are perceived to be more feeble are necessary. Paul's driving his point home in this verse. In other words, you couldn't get along with what you might consider the less honorable members of the human body. So why do you think you have no need of the members you consider to be lesser in the body of Christ? The point here is that they are not only uh, nice to have around, they're absolutely essential for the body of Christ to function as God intends it to function. We could illustrate this a couple different ways. Try to type a letter on your computer. It used to be the old typewriter, but try to type a letter on your computer and put a piece of tape over the smallest letter space-wise on your keyboard. That would be the letter I, by the way. The letter I is probably the smallest of all letters on the keyboard, but if the letter I fails to function, you'll find out just how important that little, that little letter I is when it comes to com completing your task. Paul's teaching this arrogant group of believers who are looking down their pious noses on the other believers that God has set members in the body in an interrelated, a total a vital fashion. Not only are they interrelated, but they're also interdependent upon one another. Each one needs the other and each is dependent upon the other if the assembly is to function as God intended it to function. Keep in, one mi in mind, once again, these statements were made in the direct context of those possessing the sign gifts during the economy of grace. Well, Paul was going to Jews first who had been born under the law. It was the ones with the more visually glamorous gifts that were considering themselves to be greater while the ones with the less impressive gifts were considered to be, uh, or were less honorable uh, because their gifts were less notable and they were considered to be lesser in spiritual stature. But there's a broader sense in which these passages apply to the body of Christ assemblies of our day as well. We are many members, yet one body even today. Nothing has changed that way. Nothing has changed when it comes to our union with Christ and nothing has changed when it comes to our union with fellow believers. Every member of the body of Christ today is equally joined to every other member and as equally interrelated and interdependent as the believers of Paul's day. Make no mistake about it. So since the Apostle Paul used members of the human body to illustrate the interrelationship, the interdependency of those parts of the human body that might be considered less honorable than other aspects of the body, I think there's another example we might use here. A synonym for the word honorable is the word decent. So let's carry that across to the human body for just a few moments. It goes without saying there are some parts of the body that we'd rather not expose to the general public. Am I right? Armpits might be an example. <laughs> and they, they aren't the only part of the human body, the body we'd prefer not to expose, hospital gowns notwithstanding. <laughs> However, are those parts necessary for the human body to function in a healthy and efficient manner? I needn't ask. You already know. There are a lot of sweat glands in the armpit, not to mention how about the lymph glands in that area of the body. Uh, there's been some research conducted, such as a famous experiment by Klaus uh, Wedekind, a Swiss biologist researcher, uh, to suggest the opposite sex attraction is directly related to the male sweat glands. 
Who would think that? You'd think that would be totally just the opposite. We would say, yuck. But do animals not influence mate choice through the use of scent? Sure they do. Wittekind's research suggests the same is true with humans, believe it or not. Um, wow. <laughs> Each part of the human body has a role to play when it comes to the health and efficiency of the body as a whole. Uh, even the less honorable parts. There are just some parts we'd rather not expose. Yet remove the role those parts play in the human body and you might just discover how important those parts are. This was Paul's point when it came to those possessing the sign gifts, folks. Those members of the assembly that some were considering to be of lesser importance were of equal importance in the mind of the one who designed and designated those gifts in the first place. The fact is, members of the body of Christ need one another. God designed the body of Christ to work in that manner. Because of the pride of life operating in all of us, we don't always like to admit that. Now, pride would rather stress its own in independence, its own... Uh, um, rather than its own interdependence. <laughs> but nonetheless, Paul's been illustrating through the use of the members of the human body that each member of the body of Christ needs each of the other members of the body of Christ. And that came by way of God's own design. Paul's third point, and he makes a third point, is simply this. God bestowed more honor on the less spectacular gifts. The less spectacular had more honor from God's standpoint. This brings us to verse 23. Those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon those, these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant, abundant comeliness. What's Paul saying? The Greek word translated bestow is, is uh, petitithemi, petitithemi, which literally means to put around. Paul was using the physical idea of dressing up in order to illustrate his point, how to make the undesirable, dishonorable parts more comely while well, you cover them. You dress them up. When we get dressed, those members of the body that we think to be less honorable, less respectable or admirable, less show-offable, uh, to coin a term, we dress or we cover those members more fashionably or with more abundant honor. Verse 24 continues, For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. Isn't that amazing? Put simply, when God created the physical body, God himself bestowed more honor on those parts that appear to be less honorable in the eyes of men. Why did God do that? Well, the answer is a simple one, really. God used a creative lesson to teach the body of Christ a practical lesson. Uh, we could tie it together this way. The Corinthian believers who had been given the gifts that were more visually spectacular were actually totally dependent upon the believers who had been given the less glamorous gifts. And God purposed it that way. God dressed the less visually spectacular gifts with more honor so that the ones possessing the more visibly spectacular gifts would have no reason to be arrogant when it came to their spiritual stature. Uh, the Corinthians had failed to, to learn that lesson. They failed to see what God was doing and how he was doing it. But God purposed it that way for a reason that Paul explains in verses 25 and 26. That there should be no what? That there should be no schism, uh, no separation, no division, uh, some arrogant, others envious in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Hit your finger with a hammer, and you'll see what Paul's talking about in this passage. Drop that hammer on your foot, and you'll catch Paul's point. God created an an interrelated, interdependent system when he created the human body. Um, and likewise, he created an interdependent system when he designed the body of Christ. If we could even have a vast, a, a slight concept of the overall nervous system and how the nerve works, nerves work in the body, it's magnificent, it's beyond anything we could imagine. God did so in order that we might understand how God intends the body of Christ to function. It's as simple as that. We are not only uniquely joined to Christ, totally dependent upon him, but in the very same way we are uniquely joined to Christ, we are uniquely joined to each other and dependent upon one another. Here it is once again in verse 26. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Paul brings it home here. Conceit and pretension operating on one hand with envy and covetousness operating on the other were to have no place in the Corinthian assembly, according to the Apostle Paul. 
and they should have no place in the assemblies of our day. Uh, we should never be guilty of, of making the same error as the carnal Corinthians were making. We should be concerned about each other. We should pray for one another. We should encourage one another. And most of all, we should recognize the importance uh, we each have in the eyes of the one who purposed that we be joined to each other just as we are joined to Christ. This is what the living sacrifice that Paul's talking about at the beginning of chapter 22, or ch 12 rather, is all about. Uh, as he ties both lessons together, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, both lead us to agape practice. Uh, look at Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your logical, reasonable worship. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Paul goes on, then, to say in chapter 13 of Romans, and chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is the love chapter. And what does Paul go in Romans chapter 13? Owe no man anything but to, what? <laughs> Love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Your reasonable worship, folks, is nothing other than your agape service. As love has, law has given, given way to love here. Not a practice reserved for Sunday, <laughs> uh, but a practice for every believer for every day of the week with every other believer with whom that believer comes in contact. It's a continual thing as we are willing to set serving ourselves, the desires of our flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, as we're willing to set that aside and serve others in the body of Christ. And, uh, and we need to do that. And we need to be thinking about that and thinking in those terms every day of the week. Now, that's an interesting verse. Verse 26, the last verse I put up on the board. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. In your mind, when you see that passage, owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Where does your mind take you when you see that verse? How about the first five words? Owe no man anything. Is this... Could this possibly be a financial statement that Paul's making? Sounds like it, doesn't it? Could there be more to it than financial? Could financial be included with much more involved in this verse? Absolutely, yes. And that's where we're going to take it in our next lesson. We're going to go there and see what Paul's talking about when he says, Oh, no man, anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Are we under the law? No. But, you know, Paul's going to take us to the law. He's going to take us to the things of the law right after making this statement. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Why is he taking us to statements made in the Ten Commandments right after making this statement? We're going to see that in our next lesson. It's, it's a very important lesson. And uh, you're going to see why points this, Paul points us to the law, uses law statements, says put these off. And we're going to see what the financial aspect of Romans 13 is. Uh, verse 8 is all about, and why Paul says, oh, no man, anything, where that can lead. We'll go there in our next lesson. We'll close it there for today.